but uh, you know, pretty soon I'll be thrown out of the home. That's for sure because uh, uh, because no, none of my weekends are free. You know, in in a way that every weekend there is something or the other. You know, Saturday, Sunday, even starts on Friday night because Saturday morning in India time, right? And not only in India, you know, it's all over the world. As a result, yeah, yeah. I am, I'm sorry, I am actually saying no to a lot of things because I'll have to, you know, keep my marriage. So, uh, uh, keep your bonding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is my, my, yeah, my personal uh, kind of, you know, selfish uh, motive because I love to stay at home. So that's why I'm saying no to people. Uh, otherwise, it's crazy. You know, I, I'm worried sometimes that, you know, there should not be webinar fatigue because, you know, it yes. takes a toll on you uh, looking at the screen for a long time. It is not healthy. Right. So, right. Uh, uh, also, you get tired much faster and you cannot really keep your concentration that too long. Uh, at least, for, uh, my concentration span is not very large. As a result, after a few minutes, I kind of, you know, tune off. So it, mm. that should not happen while giving a talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. So that's, uh, that's why I have started saying uh, no to a lot of uh, these things. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people are interested. Mm. And after some time, you run out of topics as well. What to talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh, nowadays, like after the webinar, they are, uh, like many, many people are pre like recording it and putting it in the YouTube. And in the, on the YouTube or, you know, that's already whatever yeah. you wanted to say, already you have said. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. uh, Gautam, that's why we uh, thought of coming up an event like this, like, uh, you know, with all due respect to all the organizers, uh, it has become like cricket, cricket in India. In every lane, by lane, if you have a ball and bat, you know, people start hitting. Like that, it was happening, and we should have proper focus. And at least we should know when you are organizing something, whether another event in the same area is there on that day or not. So those type of thing was not there. So we thought of like launching an event which will be, uh, you know, really beneficial and impactful, especially for youngsters. Yeah. So I I think also one thing to, if I may suggest one thing might work well also you know give opportunity instead of asking for people like us giving talk ask you know phd students who are doing their phds uh, so that you know th that will be very useful for them they will get feedback from people you know how their research is going and they can talk about the research what they are doing and then uh, they, you know people can give them feedback that will help in their research so i think you, people should think in those terms as well you know that will be very right. beneficial right right yeah, yeah. Th that type of uh, thought process is there uh, as you suggested so as i have already briefed on other day so these l4 will uh, involve talks panel discussions uh, from senior people and you know senior academicians and industry experts as and as you suggested that phd talk at young student or young scientist colloquia those are mm. already uh, there in our pipeline Last week. Yeah, also, I also suggested, uh, I also suggested to Chin Moy, and many, many of you can join hands and help him organize that. One of the things is that many students, I know, you know, I can see 60 participants, many of them are students currently doing PhDs, and they are interested in ac academic positions. You know, many of you have gone through that process of applying uh, for an academic position, and you know that in you know uh, in a, uh, we you, the student should hear from the people who are making those you know hiring decisions, like you know faculties at uh, you know places like IITs and IISC and other places that uh, what do they look for when someone is applying uh, for yes. PhD? What are the things you know? Of course, there are a lot of different you know. Uh, uh, bullet points in the sense, what is the academic credentials? Um, mm -hmm. How is the proposal? You know, uh, and all yes, those yes. details. If someone gives them an idea, how to, what to emphasize on when you are writing an uh, academic uh, position proposals, and what should they look into? So that because people are not trained, you know, if you as a student, you are not really trained to write a proposal. Yeah, and yeah. then, you know, most often, my experience yeah, yeah, yeah. has been, it actually, the proposal we can break. I think it's time already, so I should not keep on going. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. 
yeah yeah right no it's okay like what you suggested uh, yeah we are uh, in that as well so there uh, we'll have uh, the senior people who uh, you know who really know what are the bullet points they look for and also probably some youngsters who have experienced this kind of mm -hmm. stuff recently so mm -hmm. we can have a mixed panel yes. so we'll have yes. that uh, pretty soon maybe yeah yeah so okay we, we should start now uh origi and sibada okay sir we can start so is it like uh, recording and youtube live is already on yes sir youtube is going live on youtube okay it's already going okay so origi you can uh, take okay. care the formal way to start maybe yeah good evening and good morning to everyone I am Arizhi from the SSC ISRO. On behalf of IEEE MPGS Kerala chapter, welcome all of you in today's event. In order to continue with our activities in this uh, pandemic scenario, we had launched our webinar series, which got uh, excellent response from participants. And now this encouraged us to launch our new lecture series under the name L4, Learn from Leaders, Learn from Legends. The L4 series was auspiciously inaugurated on 17th of this month, by Dr. Ala Abu Jale, FPTS President, in presence of other dignitaries, and we had our first talk on, on that very day by Dr. Nuno Karpal. Today, we are extremely honored to have with us Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay of JPL NASA as the speaker for our second lecture of this L4 series. He is going to talk on design and innovation of uh, sensors, antennas, and systems. I heartily welcome Dr. Chattopadhyay and thank him on behalf of MPTS Kerala for accepting our invitation despite of his busy schedule. Thank you, sir. We also have with us Dr. Chitmoy Shaha, chair and founder of MPTS Kerala chapter, under whose leadership and continuous guidance we have made these events possible. And I also welcome other dignitaries uh, like uh, Dr. Javed Shibdiki, Dr. Devdeep Sharkar, and others who are present today. And also, I can see a lot of participants. I also heartily welcome them for registering and being with us today. So today's talk uh, will be followed by question by a Q&A session, and all participants are requested to put down their uh, queries in the chat box, which will be taken up in, in the Q&A sessions respectively. All the participants are also requested to uh, kindly keep themselves muted throughout the talk to avoid any noise or disturbances in course of the session. So with this, uh, we will start our today's event. Uh, in the beginning, I'd like to request Dr. Chinmay Shah to say a few words about our this L4 lecture series and just then try to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Origit. Uh, very good uh, evening and good evening uh, to all the participants and our beloved speaker, uh, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, who is very close to our heart in all fronts because he was one of the people who influenced us and who motivated us to form this MTTS Kerala chapter. I still remember the day at IMAR 2018 where I was attending the conference as a speaker uh, and I was invited for a chapter chair meeting there. I was not a chapter chair at that time because I was chairing the APS Kerala chapter. But Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, Professor Siddiqui and Professor Call invited me in the chapter uh, chairs meeting there. And there I got uh, the idea and some kind of advice to come up with this MTTS Kerala chapter, which was finally inaugurated after due process from the society and the local section in July 2019. In fact, we are really privileged to have uh, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay during the inauguration of uh, the MTTS Kerala chapter, which was subsequently reported in I, uh, IEEE Microwave magazine. And on the same day, we had technical talks by him and some of the other uh, lead speakers across <coughs> India. So as our secretary, uh, Mr. Rorijit Drift, that we uh, started this uh, webinar series uh, in around April uh, 2020, during post uh, lockdown pandemic activities. And very soon, these uh, webinar initiatives have been propagated very nicely without any kind of loss like propagation in a perfect dialectic medium. But at the same time, we want to have some event which will be really meaningful and beneficial for the youngsters and some of the uh, you know, uh, students who are trying to find their research problem. And this uh, L4 initiative, Learn from Leaders and Learn from Legends, is basically 
and uh, you know uh, you know path towards that because these senior people who have accomplished and who have uh, really had a very long uh, race in their academic as well as research and as well as IEEE leadership career, some uh, advice, some twist, or some kind of uh, you know impetus or some kind of uh, advice from them will be really useful and helpful for the youngsters in shaping their career. So with this initiative, we launched this L4 uh, you know, last week, which was inaugurated by President uh, Dr. Ala and also President-elect 2021, Dr. Uh, Anderson was there, along with uh, Dr. Chartavadai, Professor Cole, uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, and others. So as you know, this kind of uh, webinar activities is going to stay for some time because this is the new normal. And probably as you have seen, many of the premier conferences, including MTTS uh, society conference like IMS and some APS conferences like you know APS 2020 and uh, 5G conference, all these events are has gone virtual. So similarly, our academic process, learning, even research for uh, next few months is going to remain like this. So we have come up with this type of uh, initiative, and I sincerely believe that this is going to be very very useful for all of us. I will not extend because we want to hear from our uh, L4 speaker today. Just to mention that this initiative will have, uh, uh, you know, other kind of variations also because very soon we are coming going to come with a focused panel discussion. Uh, speakers on different focused themes which will be related to uh, research, shaping your careers, how to. Uh, you know, write a meaningful proposal to different organizations or how to make a good application for your uh, CV, positions, etc. So we have uh, some future plans which will be, you know, uh, revealed uh, very soon in a weekly fashion. So with this, uh, I uh, want to conclude my talk and uh, let me uh, take a couple of minutes or so to introduce our uh, speaker, uh, beloved uh, Dr. Gautam Chattavadhyay. So I'll be uh, just sharing. Uh, my screen to show uh, just a couple of slides or so. And, uh, you see my slide, uh, Sivada? It's okay, so. <clears throat> Just let me know when it is uh, completely visible. So this uh, Learn from Legends and Learn from Leaders initiative, we started uh, on 17th of this month. Uh, and these are the uh, flyers on the same day after the, just before the inauguration, we had a leadership talk by Professor Paul, followed by a technical talk on wireless power transfer by uh, Nuno uh, Carvalho. And this is uh, the you know uh, the inauguration of L4 series, the virtual photo shoot, and this is going to appear uh, in uh, Microwave Magazine. I believe so. We are in the process on that. We are really privileged to have many leaders and legends, including our beloved uh, Gautam on that day. And the today's session is divided into two parts. Part one will be technical talk, and uh, followed by the interaction. And in part two, we'll have not only the technical queries uh, to be addressed by Dr. Gautam Chattavardhai, we'll have uh, some uh, some other kind of questions, other kind of interactions also from leadership aspect, as well as uh, other queries uh, which we have to him on behalf of all the audience. So this is the flyer of today. And as you know, uh, Dr. Gautam Chattavardhai doesn't require any introduction. He's a senior scientist from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, fellow of IEEE, fellow of IIT. He's a visiting professor at California Institute of Technology. He's Bell Distinguished Chair Professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's an adjunct professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He's also associated with Cochin University of Science and Technology as an uh, uh, erudite uh, chair professor. So with this, I stop sharing. And I'll uh, now read out his CV. So, 
So this is a, a formal introduction to uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay. He is a senior scientist at NASA's Gel Pro Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, a visiting professor at Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy at the California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, USA, a Bell Distinguished Visiting Chair Professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, and a young professor at the Institute, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, India. He received PhD degree in electrical engineering from California Institute of Technology in 2000. He is a fellow of IEEE USA and IIT India and IEEE Distinguished Lecturer in I, uh, Microwave Theory and Technics Society. His research interest includes microwave, millimeter wave and terahertz receivers, systems and radars and development of space instruments for the uh, search of life beyond that. He has more than 350 publications in international journals and conferences and holds more than 20 patents. He also received more than 35 NASA Technical Achievement and New Technology Invention Award. He received the <coughs> sorry, IEEE Region 6 Engineer of the Year Award in 2018, Distinguished Alumni Award from IISD India in 2017. He was the recipient of the Best Journal Paper Award in 2020 and 2013 by IEEE Transaction on Terahertz Science and Technology, Best Paper Award for Antenna Design and Applications at the European Antennas and Propagation Conference, UCAP in 2017, and IET Professor SN, SN International Award in uh, 2014. So this is just a formal introduction to Gautar, Dr. Gautam Chattavadhyay. One more thing I just want to add that beyond this, he is one of the best human being I have ever experienced in my life. So I request uh, our beloved Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay to start the proceedings. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inman, for, for the introduction. And also, I want to thank everyone uh, for taking your time off on a, if wherever you are, uh, if you are in India on a you know Saturday evening, and if you are in out in you know, in North America in a Saturday morning. So um, I really like uh, interacting with young professional students. Uh, uh, so that's why uh, I agreed to this and Chinmay asked me, I'm really uh, grateful to all of you that I got this opportunity to talk. So I, I'm going to share my screen and you know, let's talk. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? Uh, it's, yeah, we see it already. Yes. Okay, let me make it full screen. So hopefully that will work. So it's working full screen. Yes. Can you see? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, you know, that I have been requested to give talks, you know, during this webinar, as Jingma mentioned, that, uh, you know, we have now kind of uh, of, during the pandemic, a lot of webinars have been uh, organized and many of you are giving a lot of talks and webinars, I know, and uh, I am doing the same. So as a result, I was thinking that what do I talk uh, in this forum? And one of the things I thought that it will be interesting to talk about is about the innovation part, that, okay, how innovation happens. Uh, most of you, who suppose you are a student, and then when you start doing your PhD, let's say, uh, then you are given a problem or you for search for a problem and then you try to come up with a solution. In that process, actually, uh, you'll have to innovate because you'll have to come up with new ideas. So what is that you know, process, at least from my perspective, how all this, um, you know, how you come up with new ideas? Because it is never that way that you, one morning you wake up and say, okay, let's innovate something. It, the innovation process is never that way. So most often, innovation happens when you are confronted with a problem. We all know that currently we are under this COVID-19 situation. And if you think about it, that amount of a number of innovations that has been happening over the last uh, several months is amazing because we are you know, in a global, global pandemic, and we are trying to come up with solutions how to address those. So, you know, whenever you are given a problem, that's what human mind actually starts thinking about it. And my thinking is that how it happens, the innovation happens is that 
you work in a group. So innovation most often is not an, a, a single individual uh, you know, event and that you interact with people, you talk about the problem that you are trying to solve and then you come up with a solution. So uh, what I'm going to do today, I thought that I will give you an example of a problem that we are currently solving. And there, you know, most of you, if you actually uh, distill it down, whatever research that you are doing in, in at least for in our area of, uh, you know, our field, that you either, uh, you know, build sensors, you build uh, antennas, and you build systems. So basically in, in that, of course, there are parts, our components are also there, subsystems are there. At the end of the day, if you can actually categorize all those things in these three items. And that's why I thought I put together these three items and let's see, you know, how that process works. And through that, we maybe will be able to learn something. So that is the idea of this. So the, the title of my talk is Design and Innovation, Sensors, Antennas and Systems. So before I start, I want to acknowledge my group members. So in, you know, the, at JP, JPL is a very big place. We have, you know, people from all different, uh, you know, careers, all different fields. But in, uh, we have a small group of about 24 people. We call submillimeter wave advanced technology. And if you look around all the faces, you'll see that they come from all different parts of the world. And that's what makes NASA successful, that we have people uh, from coming from all over the world, the diversity of thoughts, diversity of ideas, that helps. And I am so lucky actually to get this opportunity to interact with all these highly uh, you know, talented individuals. And that's how we make new innovation. That's how we make progress. That's how we make new designs. And I am all the stuff that I'm going to show to you today is uh, because of them, not because of me. I have been you know, lucky to actually work with them. As I mentioned that discussing with people you know, talking about uh, your uh, the problem that you are trying to solve with others is the, I think, key to new design and innovation. So let's start with this. Let's look at the problem. When we uh, innovate, you know, how we innovate and when we innovate. So one of the things that, you know, at NASA, what we do is we are trying to answer science questions. Uh, but suppose you are you suppose you are a graduate student, you are a PhD student, just entering your PhD. Then you might say that oh, we don't face these kind of problems, right? Our problems are slightly different. Yes, you know how the PhD uh, program works in different parts of the world is slightly different. Uh, like if we give the example of United States, here what happens is when you come as a PhD student, already a problem is defined for you because you are coming, your professor, your advisor has already written a proposal. It has been funded and that's why he wanted to hire a graduate student. So problem is already defined. And then you start thinking about how to solve uh, that problem. But in other places, maybe you join in and then you start thinking about looking for a problem because it takes time to find a problem that we are going to solve. So there is different kinds of, uh, you know, way we progress. So here, what I'm going to talk about is we were given a you know, problem is this. The science question is that we believe, the scientists believe that when Earth was created, there was no water and comets brought water to Earth. So if you ask this question, that okay did really comet brought water to earth how do you know what kind of experiments that we can do uh, to actually solve this problem and then to do that experiment what kind of instruments we need to build so this is the broader you know uh, situation that we are always faced and then one this example that i'm showing that if you actually think about it we have done we have actually gone to comets and did some measurements but the, uh, you know, the numbers, the actual results are all over the place. But, but we made only about 10 measurements uh, showing that to trying to answer this question that did water uh, really come from comets, Earth's water? So this is the bigger you know, problem that you are trying to solve. So I came up with an idea 
of uh, you know solving this problem using a CubeSat instrument. So I uh, you know acronym made an acronym uh, called Water Hunting Advanced Terahertz Spectrometer on Ultra Small Platform. That is WhatsApp. Well, you know people you might say why did I come up with WhatsApp? Because we are trying to answer the question what's up with water? Did really water come from comets? Did water on Earth come from comets? So if you are trying to answer this question, how do you go about this answering? What kind of experiment you can do? If you think about it, the water that we drink every day is H to 16 O. The you know, oxygen has different isotopes. Uh, so most abundant water is the, uh, with a 16th isotope of oxygen. But there are many other kinds of water. We can have water H to 17 O, H to 18 O, HDO, that is one hydrogen, one deuterium, and oxygen. So if you look at that, that each of those, uh, you know, uh, water, they have a spectroscopic signature at different frequencies. So water has, HDO has many uh, spectroscopic signatures. One of the strong line is at 509 gigahertz. So H to 7, 16 O, that the water, most abundant water that we drink every day is actually at 557 gigahertz as a very strong spectroscopic line. So if you can uh, measure the abundances of different kinds of water and take a ratio and also make a ratio of the amount of deuterium and hydrogen in that water, that actually is unique to different comets and power of planet Earth. So if we can show and go to a comet and particular kinds of comet called Jupiter family comet and make the ratio measurements on those comets and find that they're the same as planet R, then we can confidently say that source must be the same. So that is the uh, way to solve this problem. And then that you have to think about building instruments, right? So as I mentioned, that we wanted to use a CubeSat. CubeSats are very small satellites because if you want to go to a comet and do a measurement with a big mission, it costs billions of dollars. So there was a mission called Rosetta uh, mission. Uh, then there, we actually, uh, there was a lander event on, on the comet, Phyllis lander, but it did not work very well. But we had an instrument on that from JPL, where actually I was involved on that called Miro, microwave, um, you know, instrument on Rosetta Orbiter. There we try to measure those, but they ex they are very expensive. So can we make a satellite-based uh, receiver system or an instrument on a cube uh, shoebox size satellite? So that's that. The, those are CubeSats. Lot of work is going on with CubeSats. And if you are a young faculty, if you are a student, then you should think about actually building instruments for CubeSat and then approach some of the space agencies like ISRO, NASA, ESA, JAXA and others and fly your instrument. This is a great opportunity to actually make something tangible and then get some results out of it. There are many missions are planned in for future as well. So what is the key for building an instrument for this kind of missions that we are faced with? One of the thing is miniaturization and integration. Why I say that? Because every kilogram of mass that you want to launch in space actually costs huge amount of money and challenges. So if you make your instrument really integrated and you know, miniaturized, that helps you. You know, the, what you are seeing on your screen, uh, can you take a guess? It's actually the iPhone 5 entire system. If you open your smartphone, if you have not opened your smartphone, you should open your smartphone. That is a beautiful uh, piece of instrument. So I did. I opened my wife's iPhone. Uh, uh, that because you know it was water damaged. Not that I uh, <laughs> was just playing with that. So if you look at that when you open those smartphone, you will realize that what kind of engineering marvel has gone into that. How what level of integration has happened? All these different chips. You know, you can build a one single chip, SOC even, you know, system on a chip, but you have to put everything together, the connectors that you need to use. How do you place everything? How do you manage the thermal environment so that it doesn't get heat? Or sometimes, you know, on your, uh, you know, smartphone, it gets hot uh, when you are holding near your uh, head. 
So how do you manage that? How the key aspects of it you have to reduce power because for any mission what kind of antennas you are going to use let's go through that one by one and then look at what is uh, the process of innovation and uh, you know how do you come up with solutions so this is the uh, block diagram of a we are using as uh, as i said because HDO line is 509 gigahertz, uh, the H2 18O is 547, 17O 552, and 16O556 gigahertz. So you have these lines you want to target. You want to detect them. You want to measure the amplitude of, you know, the abundances of this. Uh, anyone said anything? Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay. So, uh, so this is the block diagram. First, you come up with a block diagram, right? So this is what that should be an antenna, and then because it's a cubesat, cubesat sizes that we chose is called six u. Six u stands for thirty centimeter by twenty centimeter by ten centimeter. It's not a big, uh, you know, volume uh, because most of it is going to go for all other kinds of stuff. You have to have solar panels. You have to have you know a star tracker so that you know where you are. You need to have communication, all those stuff. So at the end of the day, for your instrument, you do not have much space. It, mostly it's about 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. So these are the, uh, you know, challenges. So you, you know, come up with a block diagram and you can see that I need an antenna since I, my face, uh, the, you know, on the cube side is about, uh, you know, 18, uh, 20 centimeter. So I, we decided to go with the 18 centimeter diameter aperture. And then we need to have a calibration system so that you need to calibrate your you know, receiver so that you know whatever you are measuring is a real, like way you calibrate your a vector network analyzer. So that way you have to calibrate. Um, this is a, in a way you can think about is as a vector network analyzer as well at this frequency, but not a big box. It is a very tiny, small instrument. And then you need to have come up with a, a, a synthesizer you will need. You need sensors and also need the back end electronics. So these are the all the requirements you have. But the constraints you have is that you have to be low power. They'll have to be, uh, you know, uh, you have to have a very good antenna in a low profile antenna uh, and you have to have a low mass. So these are the challenges. So antennas. So I know many of you who are listening in work in antennas. And so we have been innovative in coming up with new kinds of antennas. This was this is, is shown, it's called Marco. Marco was a Mars CubeSat 1, that was a mission uh, to Mars called InSight. On that, we had the first time we had two CubeSat for communication that went to another planet. And why it was needed? Because what happens is when the spacecraft goes to the Martian surface, there is no direct communication link with R. To begin with, it takes about you know, seven to eight minutes for signal to reach at the speed of light from Mars to Earth because of the distance. On top of that, if there is no direct link, we don't know whether our spacecraft landed safely or not. So to avoid that, what was done as a te technology demonstration that we built two six U CubeSats, again, this is 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter. So very small in volume. It had antennas. One was UHF antenna to communicate with the spacecraft and another was X-band antenna to direct communication to Earth. X-band antenna was a reflector antenna. My colleague, um, you know, Nasser, many of you know Nasser Chahat was involved. Uh, Manu, uh, Emmanuel, uh, you know, he was also involved in uh, in the designing some of this. So a lot of people came together and this is a uh, deployable antenna because to have a direct communication link with art from Mars, you will need large aperture because you know to have you do not have enough power. So we came up with this idea of uh, you know uh, whole level antennas. You know this is a, a reflector. A. So we we are uh, you know those problem we are faced with and come came up with a solution. But this is at as I said UHF and X band. And also there was another thing that we did recently was called RainCube. 
Rain cube is a radar on a cube set, but it had needed to have a large aperture at K band, so about 33 gigahertz. So this is a 50 centimeter a deployable mesh uh, antenna, uh, you know, parabolic dish kind of antenna that was needed because of the requirements of the mission. Then how do you come up with an antenna that fits in, in a very small volume and then deploys and works well? So that was the challenge. So here again, you know, uh, my colleagues, they came up with a very innovative solution. Again, when you are thinking, I keep mentioning one thing, teamwork, because you can be a very good uh, you know, antenna designer and come up with an antenna, but if you do not have mechanical help, how do you actually deploy this kind of antenna? How do you actually come up with all the mechanical architecture? So you'll have to talk to people who has expertise in all different areas. So one person is not enough. I always say, you know, so that's a build team. Talk to your friends who has expertise in other areas. Go and talk to them. They might actually give you ideas, innovative ideas that you can actually run with. So always think about that. So I'll show you a, a short video how uh, many of you might have seen before that how this antenna is deployed. This is in the lab. Once you release a, uh, a you know, a pin, then this starts happening. This spring loaded, it starts opening it up, and this, this is the main reflector. This uh, deploys, and then there is a sub reflector because what you see here is actually a, a, a horn. This is multi flare angle horn uh, in K band, and there, there is a sub reflector, and everything has to work well. Otherwise, uh, you know, as you know, at K band, if the position of the sub reflector is not correct, you are not going to get the directivity and the efficiency that we're looking for. So again, we are, why I'm showing all this, though this is not related to 500 gigahertz system, but, you know, we are faced with challenges and then we come up with new solutions because that's when you start thinking, how do you solve this problem? How do you fit in a 50 centimeter, um, you know, reflector antenna in a 10 centimeter volume? And then when it deploys, it works well. So this was, this was the challenge. So then we actually started thinking about a very low profile antenna. As I mentioned, for the CubeSat that we are trying to do, we, we cannot have, you know, we cannot really make a, a, the, this kind of antenna at 500 gigahertz, which will deploy and work well. Because your, if you look at the surface accuracy needed, we need about 15 micron surface RMS or even better. And then, so there's a lot of challenges. So we'll have to come up with a different kind of architecture. So, you know, I have been uh, working on some uh, meta surface antenna. So we thought, okay, let's look into this. Can we make something in metal that can go on the sidewall of a spacecraft? That becomes the antenna. So we came up with something called a Fakir bed antenna. Fakir bed antenna, I call it Fakir is the term used in India, uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit, it means saints, and they sleep on bed of nails. And if you look at these structures, these actually are nails, bed of nails. That's why I call it Fakir bed antenna. So what it is, this is actually a meta surface antenna, all metal structure. So if what you see at the center is a circular waveguide, and it you have to circular waveguide, the dominant mode is T11, but what you need to Devil, uh, generate is a surface wave, TM01 wave uh, mode. So we from a uh, you know, circular wave that you can uh, generate the TM01. And when that surface wave is generated, it, it will propagate on that surface. However, if you can modulate the surface wave as it is propagating, you'll be able to get good radiation. And this is all metal. So entire structure is metal. So, you know, in space, all metal has a lot of advantages compared to dielectrics because dielectrics can get charged up in space because all these you know, high energy particles are there. So all metal structure is important. This is a 300 gigahertz antenna that we develop. And you know, the, you can see the height of these pins are about 115 micron. Thickness of your hair is 50 micron to 200 micron. So, you know, people who are young, the 200 micron people like me who are getting old, our hair gets thinner. So we get maybe 50 micron. So there, 
So not, it's just like a hair, the thickness, entire antenna is so thin. So you won't even realize that it's actually there's an antenna. So that there is circular waveguide and behind that is your system. So if you, this kind of antenna is really interesting. So we came up with that and we did measurements and it worked really well. So we, we fabricated this antenna using silicon micro machining. So you take a piece of silicon and actually make these structures uh, I have a colleague, great colleague, Cecile. She is, uh, you know, expert in doing DRI techniques, and she, uh, you know, fabricated this, and we metallized this antenna and tested it. Worked well. So we have now. You see, we have solved one of the problems of the antenna side, but that is not enough. You know, of course, how do we, there are a lot of other challenges. How do we make a 18 centimeter aperture with that? Because this antenna that we made is a small one, you know, uh, about five centimeter aperture. Then you'll have to tile them together. How do fabrication in your clean room when you are fabricating, the, then making large, uh, uh, you know, wafers is not very easy. So there are challenges. So we, are, we still are thinking that, okay, we have to come up with maybe some other easier way to fabricate antenna. So we, again, we came up with two different ideas. One is a lens-based, very low profile antenna using a leaky wave feed. So what happens is that if you have a leaky wave feed and then you can generate the feed pattern, not a Gaussian feed pattern, but you know, more of a top hair radiation pattern, then you can illuminate a very thin lens at the top and then come up with a very good antenna. So we did design uh, uh, this antenna and my uh, one of my colleague again, uh, Maria Alonso, she was a postdoc with me and then she joined JPL. Now she's a faculty at TU Delft. Uh, she actually, we worked together and then came up with the antenna we fabricated and it actually worked very well. You can see here, this is an antenna working at 500 gigahertz and this is 18 centimeter in diameter and it has a leaky wave field. The entire, the thickness of the antenna is only 7 centimeter. So this is very low profile that can easily fit in in a CubeSat environment. So that was the idea, and we, we get good performance from these. These are actually, uh, you know, uh, measured uh, performance of this antenna. And then we also thought, okay, we should also look at because when you are outer space, if you are exposing a very thin silicon, they have a lot of challenges as well. So it should survive the vibration and all. So we thought that okay, we should have it as a backup. We should have another antenna design, low profile. Uh, this is a low profile reflector antenna, very low profile. You can see even the less than seven centimeter. As you know, if you put a, uh, a reflector antenna with a sub reflector, you know, Cassegrain system, then your sub reflector generally is kind of far off. You can put a horn at the hole that is here. And then you, the, this is the sub reflector uh, at the center that you see. But we had to put the sub reflector very close to this so that you make it low profile antenna. And we actually fabricated, this is a fabricated antenna and it works really well. So we, if you saw my first slide, the, the cartoon that you saw actually showing this antenna uh, that, that we have. So we have settled down, uh, we have a lot of options now. See, we, we had a challenge of making low profile antenna at this frequency. We came up with different solutions, talking to different people and three different kinds of antenna we, we, we developed, and then we can use any one of those. So that is uh, the advantage. Next thing that you'll have to do, think about it is that, you know, as I mentioned, power is a big, big problem for this kind of instrument, because whenever you are trying to generate a signal at terahertz frequencies, you need huge amount of DC power, but with that we don't have for our CubeSats instrument. So one of the things that we started looking to SOCs because it's the iPhone technology. If your smartphone, you use SOCs, right? System on a chip. It is a CMOS-based system. And then I had a great, you know, we have a great engineer with us, my colleague, Adrian Tang. He graduated from UCLA with Frank Chang's group. And then we started uh, devoting our time developing CMOS-based synthesizer that works at W Bank at 90 gigahertz. So this is CMOS best circuits at 90 gigahertz because if you buy a synthesizer at, uh, you know, at the, if you look at your signal generator, if you actually looking at that, then it is a huge box and it needs a lot of 
power, but we cannot afford to do that. So we came up with this SOC based synthesizer, entire synthesizer, which draws less than 200 milliwatt of power at W band. So that is amazing. So we actually did that and it works really well. You can see here the phase noise, this is a measured phase noise of this synthesizer working at uh, W band. This is at 90 gigahertz at 90 dBc uh, per hertz at one megahertz offset that meets our requirement. And then also we need backend spectrometer because when you get the signal, you'll have to actually, spectrometer is a spectrum analyzer. So we'll have to build an entire spectrum analyzer working at three to six gigahertz bandwidth, but draws about less than two watts of power. You know, how much power your spectrum analyzer draws, the one that you have on the desktop is huge. But we actually solved that problem. Again, we came up with this solution of developing a three gigahertz bandwidth spectrum analyzer spectrometer with 4,000 channels. That means that each uh, you know, signal is about 70, 750 megahertz uh, width or wide. So we, we saw that and now you can see that if you buy a commercial synthesizer that can go on your spacecraft, draw six watts of power, we are now drawing only 200 milliwatt. And this commercial uh, you know, spectrometer that you can buy that draws about 10 watts of power. Now we are drawing two watts of power. So we came up with this solution to solve this problem. And then there are a few other things you need. You know, this is the instrument that we put together, the first generation of instrument, this is the entire spectrometer, but we need to have a calibration. Because as you, as I said, that without calibration, you won't know what you're measuring. So how do you calibrate such a system? There is something called flip mirror based technique in space, because what you can do is your system can look in the you know, cold sky. Our sky is cold, uh, you know, three Kelvin. So if you can actually look, uh, your instrument can look at two different temperatures, that is two different loads. Uh, one is very cold, one is hot. Then you can, from that, you can calculate the power that is going in so that you can know what is the gain of your system. And from there, you can cal you know, calibrate your system. One of the way that is done traditionally is using, you can see here on the left, there's a flip mirror, there's a motor that flips the mirror because this is a quasi optical system. The beam that comes out of your horn hits the mirror and the mirror can actually reflect that to your load. This is actually room temperature load. Or if you move it out, then it goes straight to the sky. That's what you are trying to observe. So, but it again, this uh, motors needs power. And this is a mechanical system. So there is a single point failure. If it motor is stuck, then we our system is not going to work. So to solve that problem, we came up with a MEMS switch at terahertz frequencies. This is for the first time anyone actually built a low noise, a low loss uh, switch that can replace this flip mirror technique. So well, I had again another uh, you know, postdoc who joined in as Theodore Rec and all of us worked together and came up with a MEMS based switch. What you see here on this is two are waveguides. So how we, you all know about waveguides, you know, in a waveguide, if you change the A dimension of your waveguide, you change the cutoff frequency, right? So waveguide is a high pass filter. So, which means that if you're above the cutoff frequency, you have transmission, but below the cutoff frequency, it's actually stopping everything. So it can act as a switch. If you have two waveguides, and if you have very thin aperture, you can see the kind of septum. If you, with the MEM structure, you can move the septum in and out of your waveguide, changing the A dimension. Then what happens that one of the waveguide can, you can make it, you know, under cutoff, other one is open. And if it moves away, then the other one becomes uh, open and this one becomes under cutoff. So in that way, you can make a very good switch that can, uh, you know, look either in the sky or to your load. So we can replace this, the mechanical system altogether. So I, we actually build this, we have designed it, fabricated it, and it works. I'll show you, you know, on a video, you'll be able to see that how uh, the two uh, septums moving in and out of two waveguides. So opening one and closing the other and the vice versa. So hopefully you'll be able to see this. You can see here, once we actuate it, and you can see here, it's moving, this is at the center, all those orange, uh, those two are waveguide vertically looking down and you are actually changing 
you know, uh, the cutoff frequency of those waveguides. And this is a very low loss system that we built. So that it worked really well. So now we are actually using these in our system. So we solved the problem for this, uh, you know, uh, calibration as well. So, but if you're looking at, you know, if you have a, what we do in this with the spacecraft is, as I mentioned, one of the temperature that you can look at is the load that will be, let's say room temperature, but we need another temperature. And that is looking at the cold sky. But if you have a CubeSat, you do not want to turn your entire CubeSat to look at the cold sky. So what we did is actually came up with a load that is, you know, uh, programmable uh, temperature in the sense that you can change the load temperature with over, uh, you know, over a long range of temperatures. Again, it has to work in a waveguide system at 500 gigahertz. So we did is we came up with this idea of a, you know, this is, there is a lot of feedback system. We heat it up and get different temperatures. It has to be very accurate. We read it out. And you can see here, this is the design that we did uh, of the load. And these are all waveguide structures at 500 gigahertz. And it is working really well. You can see the match uh, is very good. We have PID controller. We actually change that go about 600 Kelvin. So we can change from 300 Kelvin to 600 Kelvin. So, and in very accurate and controlled way so that you know the temperature very well. So now we have the antennas done. We have the system, we short key diagnostic system that we have been using as sensors. We have low power synthesizer. We have low power back and spectrometer. We have a MEMS based switch and a calibration load. Now we are ready. If you put now everything together, what you get is your system. This is the entire 500 to 600 gigahertz spectrometer instrument that actually can do a lot of things. A lot of people are interested in you know for this kind of instrument uh, for for space for planetary exploration you can see the total mass of this instrument now is two kilogram and the total power required for this instrument is less than five watts so if you look back where we started if you actually before we started doing all this uh, the total mass for an instrument like this is to be at least 20 kilograms or more and the power needed to operate this kind of instrument, about 80 watts or more. So that is beyond a CubeSat system. You cannot put a 20 kilograms mass and 80 watts power requirement in a CubeSat based system. It's not doable. But now that we have made all this innovation and this new design, now the mass and power in a range and without really sacrificing the performance of this instrument then we can fly it now it's ready so we actually to demonstrate that everything works we are putting in a balloon uh to you know on the we will we'll fly it in the next um in the next year actually we are supposed to fly this year but because of pandemic we are not able to do that so it's ready so this is uh, in the we actually put together a, a, a balloon born instrument that will fly to test so that was you know, what I was trying to tell you all from the beginning is that how the innovation happens, that you are faced with a challenge, you are faced with a problem that will have to solve this. And then you start thinking about how do we solve this so that we can get the result that we desire. desire. And then you have to put your all the brain powers together, come up with a solution, try it out. You'll fail. You know, all this stuff that I have shown, I'm telling you a success story. What I'm not telling you uh, is a lot of things that did not work, that we have to really scratch our head. So if you design something and it works, you go and you design something, you fabricate it and go to the lab and test it and it works great in the first try, you should be doubtful. You should be thinking, did I do something wrong? <laughs> because, you know, most often, you know, our world is such that it doesn't work in the first try. So, you know, there are a lot of heartbreaks, there are a lot of, you know, heartaches. So it happens. But at the end, if you uh, keep trying in Hindi, they say, Lage raho munna bhai. so if you keep trying, then it, it you'll be uh, able to, you know, come up with a solution. So I will end with something else, another innovation that was done recently. Many of you know about it. And two slides, then I'll open it up for questions because I know you have a lot of questions. 
So I will talk about Mars helicopter. I'll end with this. Again, Mars helicopter was, what was the need of Mars helicopter? What was the need and how do you, you know, uh, how, how did you come up with this solution? So you know that we are sending a rover to Mars. What happens to the rover is that rover goes there and it lands and then it is already pre-programmed. This is the most expensive autonomous car, you know, self-driving car that we can build. So that is the rover. And it has all this you know, obstacle avoidance and everything, but this has limited range of where you can go and do experiment. So we thought that if we have a helicopter on at the rover that we can take off and it has all these kind of sensors, they could go around, you know, take pictures and, you know, get other data and send the data back to the rover. And then the rover will go there and do experiments. That would be great. But there is a lot of problems. If you make a small helicopter on Earth, the blade that goes around the rotator blade rotates about 400 to 600 RPM. But Mars atmosphere is much lighter. So you need to have much higher rotating speed, about you know, 2,600 to 3,000 RPM. That is huge. So that you have to come up with new materials. You'll have to come up with you know, so that you have the lift that is needed. And total mass has to be very low. It has, but again, it has to be power. You need power for a helicopter to go at, you know, the rotator to rotate at 3000 RPM and go on top of that, you need to have sensors, you need to have communication system to send it back. So there are lots of challenges. And again, the, it, it turns out that when the mechanical engineers did the design of the blades, they used a material which is very much like metal and you need to have antennas that is communicating. As, as, as antenna engineers, many of you know that if there is a metal obstruction in front of your antenna, your, you know, all your carefully designed radiation patterns got, you know, goes bust. So we'll have to solve a lot of problems, but we did. We actually uh, you know, attacked each and uh, every one of them, came up with innovative solutions. And then this is the Ingenuity helicopter that got ready and it is uh, it has been just before when it was actually integrated with the you know, perseverance rover it is on its way right now to mars it will land the rover will land on mars in february 2021 and then let's hope that the helicopter gets an opportunity to fly on mars that will be the for the first time helicopter flying on another planet so that is a really cool so that's why you know uh, when you do innovate, you know, when you come up with new designs, you actually feel really great. So that is the best feeling in, the, in this world. So I, with that, I'll end. And so I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Gautam, for your excellent talk. And always, it has been so illuminating, and you uh, covered quite a uh, aspect, a 360-degree view of uh, space research in general. But you also talked about two specific case of innovation. So now we come to the second part of this L4 series, where we have uh, some technical queries in the chat box. Also, some of our uh, office bearers and some of our friends want to interact with uh, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay because the whole idea of this L4 is to hear from the speakers, not only on the technical fronts, as well as other fronts also. So before I uh, do that, uh, I take the questions from the chat box and I uh, request some of you to speak. Uh, I just once again uh, go to, you know, sharing the screen and go to the second part of this talk. So thank you uh, very much to all of you for uh, your uh, patient uh, learning and hearing. So here we uh, start the second part, here the legend. So 
as many of you know uh, the journey of uh, dr gautam chattopadhyay from uh, a village uh, of uh, kolkata in hubli district uh, that uh, from to nasa from there to nasa has been a phenomenal journey he has achieved so many laurels and so many achievements in all fronts starting from academic fronts to uh, ieee fellow as well as uh, many best paper awards many recognition in ieee journals and forum so here i uh, you know give you the opportunity to know from about his journey and you can feel free to ask uh, him also very soon is a glimpses of the journey of our uh, speaker dr chattopadhyay he uh, did his early education in a school from navogram vidyapeet west bengal india then uh, bachelor of engineering from iiest shipur then me from university of virginia he is of calte and as i have already mentioned you can see from his profile he has many pub publications and patents in his credit and these are some of the awards editions he has received uh, ieee regions engineer of the year award in 2018 distinguished alumni award from indian institute of engineering science and technology in 2017 best journal paper award in various forums and uh, in ucap as well and iit professor eshon sen mitro memorial award in 2014 so we contacted dr chattopadhyay to uh, you know say something about his early career because being a very close uh, you know friend of uh, him and uh, you know already blessed with on various fronts so we know some of his uh, you know early days fights and how he have grown up from a small village and uh, you know a little bit of some of different fronts uh, in his uh, family but he has been the main point is he has always been grounded he mentions this particular thing during his talk also even if he works for the space antennas he but he has been always grounded and he is always very supportive and he you know that's why you can see some of his photos like uh, you know with his uh, brother and then you can see uh, you know with a photograph with his uh, school teacher in front of the california institute of technology so i'll be requesting dr gautam chattopadhyay to say something about your early career about uh, your uh, journey from uh, navogram to nasa of course to uh, various paths and various milestones over to you uh, gautam so oh, okay uh, thank you finmoy uh, okay so i grew up like many of you uh, in a very uh, small village outskirts of uh, kolkata and and then um, you know for for us you know i i have only one picture as a kid uh, this one myself and my, my brother because we didn't have a camera of course so someone took this picture and we found it high, you know in one of the uh, you know trunk somewhere at home so that's what i took this picture i i took scanned it and so uh, you know again i don't want to uh, you know talk really more about and i don't want to highlight our poverty and all but that is also part of us that many of us go through the similar kind of situation so in a way so i i tell this story so that you know that if you work hard and if you have a goal in your life so uh, there there are a lot of challenges but still uh, there is a way to overcome those and those, those challenges so in in my personal life we did that when you know i i i'll tell you a story when we were in third grade actually my my brother is one year younger to me his name is buddhadev chattopadhyay we actually studied in the same class so he was uh, not that i you know failed in one grade uh, that he was one year ahead uh in in school and then we were in third grade and in our school that we used to go in our uh, locality it was not completely free we had very minimum some uh, you know a couple of rupees uh, per month you know fees but you know we my parents struggled to pay that fee and one we were writing our exam in third grade and in india at least at that time i don't know if the situation has changed people really didn't care about but how the kids uh, you know psychology will work you know they are, uh, so uh, since our fees are not paid we uh, were asked 
you know, we called in in front of everyone and thrown out of a exam, you know, third year, uh, third grade exam, and we were sent back home. Uh, so again, how it impacts the psychology of a small kid is uh, people don't really think. And then again, my mom uh, somehow was able to convince uh, that school authority to allow us to sit in the exam. And uh, we could not write that exam fully, the, the one that we were thrown out of. So again, but okay, we did okay. So, but one of the things that I want to talk about here is that that did not really make me bitter. So not me, not even yeah, not my brother, because that's what, you know, we face in our life, we will face a lot of challenges and many times uh, things will be fair to us. You know, that we, we see all the time. Yes, we'll have to fight to make those changes so that these things are fair. But at the same time, we'll also have to make, you know, make uh, us resilient to stand up back and not feel bitter about it. So that's what I want to tell uh, tell you about that. So we, uh, I went to Bengal Engineering College, uh, the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, oldest engineering college in India. And then from there, I went to TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. You can see of the picture, the Govind Sorup, uh, Professor Sorup, who recently passed away. Uh, uh, so I got this opportunity to work with him and then came to US and, uh, did my master's in Virginia. And then I had this, you know, uh, you know, be in my bonnet to, uh, you know, go apply to Caltech. I was very fascinated about Caltech, MIT and all. So I uh, applied there and got this opportunity to work there. And I came to Caltech. And then when I came here, I though was in the electrical engineering, but my advisor was in physics. And, you know, every year during winter time, you know, next, you know, three doors next to my office is to be Stephen Hawking is to sit there. So I used to talk to him and a lot of, you know, famous uh, physics professors. So I had a lot of exposure to physics and that way, you know, really helped me in my career understanding because you have to actually understand if you are working in space uh, uh, in industry or uh, space organization, it, it science aspects are very, very important that you have to understand what science you are doing. So that helped me so that, and then after I was finishing my PhD, I got a call from NASA to ask me to join there. And I was of course, very, very happy jumping up and down because that was my dream place. And I am loving every bit of it and really enjoy uh, this. Uh, I always feel I'm a student uh, because you know there's so many things to learn. And I say one thing that I really uh, mean it when I say that more you learn, more I realize that how less I know. So that is one of the thing, uh, you know, realization that that comes to you. And with that, that that has been my journey. It has been, a, you know, sometimes I feel I'm still dreaming as a kid. Uh, so, uh, so, but I'm living my dream, and I'm so, uh, you know, lucky and fortunate to get to work with really great people. Because if you want to be successful in your life. My advice to you is that surround yourself with smart people and, you know, who are smarter than you are. That's what I have done. You know, I am right now amongst people who are all, all of you are smarter than I am. And that makes me very happy. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I am uh, ready to take questions on, you know, uh, you know, technical questions. But again, I want to say that I cannot really go and read all the questions. So someone else will uh, read it for me. Uh, so if your question is not answered, not that I am ignoring you, is that because, you know, uh, they are the one who are going to ask those questions. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, that, uh, do the moderation uh, for the technical questions that we see on the chat box. But for that, thank you very much once again for uh, wonderfully talking about your early journeys and we know these are some examples uh, because the way you have uh, compared the different situations and you have come up to this particular position and you have enlightened the entire academic as well as research community, especially in the frontiers of space research is phenomenal. So uh, hearing that journey, especially for uh, some of the people who are not aware of is uh, probably very, you know, uh, so here we have a technical uh, questions in the chat box.
So one question is, it's not a technical question though, but I uh, think it's a very important one. So uh, what is the way to get some kind of internship opportunity in NASA? So, that so is, far, uh, yes. yeah. Okay, before I answer that question, you know, Chinmoy, Chinmoy works at a part of ISRO. So you should look into your, if you are from India, you should first look at internship uh, opportunities in ISRO. And so that is very important. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, then you should, uh, of course, look for uh, NASA has a lot of internship opportunities for students. And so you should go to nasa.gov website. And there are some restrictions because restriction is that uh, we can take only about total all across NASA centers. We can take 100 international students per year only 100 because that is posed by you know uh, in uh, state department so the so the op, so limited number of openings so every year the internship portal opens up sometimes in january i know that a lot of people first thing when they connect with me on linkedin or somewhere else first thing they said give me an internship so i cannot give you an internship because that is a uh, the way the nasa actually handles is very different individuals we cannot really go and tell you oh yeah come come over for internship we cannot do that because we have to be fair to everyone people are applying from all over the world and so we'll have to be fair we have to have a fair process so that's why there is a central you know system you apply there and to uh, evaluation that's how you can come so go to nasa.gov and look for internship opportunities for students again international students are allowed for internship but there are limited number of uh, openings. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you uh, very much, Gautam. During talk, you are talking about the international set of people in NASA as well as in your research group. You have a spectrum of uh, researchers, PhD and postdoc from different countries. So you said that is one of the strength of NASA as well as your research group. So can you uh, also talk on, as a follow-up of this question, I would request you to talk on the process of getting a PhD position or a postdoctoral position in your group, uh, as well as in general, the JPL Caltech, uh, you know. Uh, so again, so, uh, so for postdocs, we, um, you know, NASA we actually sometimes have co-advised students for PhD, but we cannot take direct PhD students. What we do is we actually, uh, have postdocs. NASA has a very uh, good postdoctoral program called NPP, NASA Postdoctoral Program. So you can do a Google search on NPP, NASA NPP, then you will see. So what you will see there is that people who are uh, advisors, as uh, you know, uh, postdoc advisors, we put requirements. You know, uh, so you can go to scan through that. That is for all across NASA, and then it, which matches your interest. You know, it, it is very important. I see some someone is working in a completely different area, but says, "Oh, I want to work with you." Uh, I cannot really take you because you know these are a very specific requirement that you have to put uh, on the website. And if your uh, interest, if your uh, expertise matches those, only then we will be able to take it. So go through that and see which one matches and then you can apply. Then you can contact the person who is working in this area. Sometimes we have, you know, we already have few postdocs, then you cannot take in any more because there are a limited number of people one can take. Because these are highly, you know, these are paid. Uh, you know, uh, NASA pays from their own fund. There's a separate fund for that. I want to pay from my research, own research funds. So, as a, and these are well paid. Uh, you know, these uh, postdoctoral programs are very well paid programs. So, you should look into that. So, that's why they make selection. I don't have any hand. Uh, even if I want a postdoc, I don't have any hand in selection because selection is done through a, you know, uh, the committee. They go through all the applicants, then they rank them, and accordingly, the amount of funds they have, then they decide. So, you know, you can, uh, you know, apply, you can talk to the people who have put in the advertisement, but again, just be aware that, uh, you know, decision is not in those individuals' hand. Right. Thank you very much. There are uh, quite a few questions in the chat box. But I won't go, uh, you know, one by one because people 
are interlinked are connected questions so i'll uh, those questions, uh, on my own in a, a different perspective so that uh, more or less all the things will start. there is a focus question uh, from a phd scholar uh, so first is appreciation appreciation about your talk and then the next point is how can we exactly confirm the origin of water in earth through whatsapp so this is the first part of the question so okay so i was saying that as we know through our measurements we know very accurately what is the ratio of different kinds of abundances a ratio of different kind of water and what is the ratio of dorh that we can do measurement here because these measurements are extremely high quality measurement that we do because these are very high resolution spectrometers their sensitivities are parts per trillion so if there is even you know one part of water available in <laughs> one trillion of other molecules uh, you know in gas you can still detect them because they're very uh, highly sensitive measurement so these ratios once you know on earth and if you go to another comet and you do the measurement and you find the ratios are same so that's that's the link that link is that the sources has yeah. to be same yeah. otherwise you do not get the same ratios so that's how we can actually be confident uh, that again you your confidence comes from the capability of your instrument, that what the instrument is capable of, what is the sensitivity of your instrument, how well you are measuring, how your measurement is not corrupted by other uh, measurement. So yes, it is not a very simple process. It's not that just take the data and you are done. You it has to go through a lot of you know you know looking very carefully before we actually make any of such announcements. We go through like uh, all of you, you know, you are, all of you actually check, double check. Same way we do that same thing. Yeah, in fact, uh, very nicely addressed. And in fact, you have already addressed the second part of the question. But just I would, uh, you know, read it out. Won't there be interference with the heat generated by active components since the frequency we look up to is 500 gigahertz? So this is connected with the previous question. Yeah, so there's a very good question. Yes, heat is an issue. However, you know, our active component, this is a passive instrument. I just want to make sure first this is a passive instrument, not a radar. Uh, we are not transmitting anything. We are actually detecting it. The generate power that we generate yeah. is to do the heterodyning because the local oscillator of our uh, you know, system. Heterodyning gives us very high res spec uh, frequency resolution. You know, so that's why because we need to measure the isolate the line with a very high you know uh, spectrum uh, spectral resolution like your spectrum analyzer when you change your resolution bandwidth and you uh, you know averaging you do that by changing your video bandwidth right so it's very similar to that so how, how what is the resolution bandwidth of your system and that's how we can isolate the line and we can measure the line very accurately in terms of corruption yes if you generate too much of heat and your sensor that you are detecting it gets too hot then your noise performance of the sensor goes down right so you cannot really then your sensitivity goes down so we'll have to make sure that you do a good thermal design but again we are doing spectrum spectral measurement here this is not a radiometric measurement, it's a spectral measurement. So that's slightly different uh, on, on that. Uh, but you can actually still act depending on what sensitivity you are getting at the given temperature of your detector, you'll be able to know, uh, you know, what is the signal strength that you are receiving. Yeah, yeah. Very nicely addressed, Gautam. Just to connect with this particular question, uh, I have, uh, I, I would rather request you to address a uh, few issues related to, you know, the difference between the conventional academic research and space research. Whenever we talk about any component which is for space or space qualified, be it antenna or pitch circuit uh, or any system for payload applications or whatever, uh, we have to. Uh, for a huge uh, temperature testing the system has to work from uh, some several of um, 100 minus of 100 degrees centigrade to plus few hundred degrees centigrade then vibration test and etc so in general can you please talk about the uh, you know extra focus or extra care that is needed for complying the, the and uh, you know stamp that that particular component is compatible for space application yes Again, yes. important question. Uh, wow, so there's some, some feedback. 
so anyway, so the, the answer to that is that, okay, so there are a couple of things is that very important for space is it has to go through vibration. So whatever you design, right. Right. You know, we do the components, we do the subsystem system level and the system level, we go through a lot of tests. Like every, all space agencies, they go through called thermal vac in the sense that you have to do in a vacuum chamber because space is a vacuum. So you'll have to in a vacuum chamber, you'll have to go through the thermal cycling that can it withstand the temperature and can it withstand the thermal cycling that it goes through some on the surface of Mars, you know, temperatures it varies quite a bit. And even if you are going through space, right, temperature right. gets very cold and then it warm. So does it survive those? So thermal vac is one thing that you have to test. You have to radiation environment, you have to test. Because outer space, you know, the solar wind creates all these, uh, you know, high energy particles that are constantly hitting uh, your, uh, you know, detectors. Can they survive? What kind of, uh, you know, radiation level your system can survive? And if uh, what kind of shielding you need to do? for that so that of course you'll have to pay attention to that and you know quality assurance you'll have to do does it survive the launch because you know it will go through a lot of vibrations so yes we do go through all these uh, uh you know different kind of testing that's why it takes time that's why it's very expensive business because you'll have to make it just not that it works in the lab and you are done that is it does not work that way Another thing I just want to mention that another thing that we very important that we actually pay attention to is called planetary protection. Because if you are trying to actually detect life on other places, you should not carry life from Earth, right? So we have to make sure we scrub our instrument, our cover, scrub our spacecraft very well so that we are not carrying life from here and detecting there. So this is a very, very important aspect uh, of our uh, you know, uh, space missions. Exactly. Thank you very much. Probably one takeaway from this particular part of the interaction is, uh, especially for the young stars, when you're then you should also see the different constraint that the space research will have on your system. So uh, making an open-ended research is good, but when the research is linked to certain applications, be it industry applications or specific space applications, you're, uh, you will have more constraint on your design and thereby in long run probably you will be uh, benefited because your research will be more uh, close to the system design or for certain applications so i so one query a quick query rather i would say regarding the future of meta surface antenna yeah future is this is a very question so so you are asking me to uh, this is not a you know, it's a simple question because I, it's, I don't have the silver bullet to tell you what the future is. But meta surfaces are looking really good in in many different applications in terms of antennas that we can see that it has advantages, but it has disadvantages also. If you look at the meta surface designs, you know one of the uh, uh, problem at problematic area for meta surface is the bandwidth because if right. you see right. that they are uh, primarily narrow band. And the second issue is about their efficiency. Right. That is a, recently there was a paper by uh, Stefano Macchi, my uh, he's my collaborator, Stefano Macchi from uh, Italy, uh, that he they have shown theoretically we can get about eighty five percent efficiency for this kind of antenna. However, practically we still have not reached there, so that we have a long way to go. So uh, those are the you know areas of whenever you are you know trying to uh, doing something for us we are we need something that needs to work so it is not about just the meta surface we have to see that what are the pros and cons of this so there are a lot of pros as I talked to about it can be low profile it it's a very different kind of antenna but there are some cons as well so we'll have to be cognizant about it. Thank you very much, Gautam. So one more query uh, related to the space research is, how can you be sure that the comet under observation has the same water ratio as the comet that brought water to Earth? So exactly, so because, you know how, because most of the comet that we, we believe that, you know, we see different kinds of comets. So one kind of comet is called Jupiter family comet because which comets actually coming out and then through the Jupiter, and it actually gathers water and then you know that they they flew to uh, near close to earth so they call the jupiter family comet the one of the plots that i showed 
at the beginning of the what the what I talked about WhatsApp. There, you know, you had seen all different kinds of comet in some chondrites and you know different kinds of comet. So we are particularly looking at Jupiter family comets because we believe that so far the evidence has so some of the measurement that we have done. We are finding those comets has very similar ratio that I was going to uh, I was talking about on in and to our Earth's you know water. So that's why we kind of believe that those are the comets that brought water. water. Right. There is a uh, question by uh, Dr. S. Raghavan. Uh, he's a senior uh, professor and recently retired from NIT Trichy. So I would request if you are there uh, kindly, you can ask the question directly. Professor Raghavan, you may unmute and please ask oh. the question. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to know how many percentage, percentage of NASA scientists uh, okay, so good question. Actually, uh, there are a lot of Indians in NASA. Uh, that is for sure. I won't be able to tell you exact percentage, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, they, because I have to take a guess in that case. Uh, but one thing I can tell you, there are a lot of Indian people in NASA. That's for sure. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah. So, Professor Raghavan, if you have any other comment in general or any, any other uh, general question you can ask, no, no, uh, today's talk has inspired uh, many persons. That's all I want to comment. Now, people are imagining of reaching NASA. They will work with the new, uh, really a legend. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Go to the, yeah, before we go to the uh, few more queries, uh, can we have a group photo? May I request all of you to turn on your uh, uh, video or camera? Our volunteer will uh, take a screenshot. Yeah, now I can see some of the faces. Yes, I recognize many of the faces now. Sir, uh, it's over. Like, it's done? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, Professor Siddiqui uh, over here. I know he connected very early morning from Kingston, Ontario. So I request uh, Professor Siddiqui to say something on this occasion. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chimoy, and thank you very much, Gautamda. I was waiting for this lecture because I said I have the lectures that was delivered by you on life beyond Earth and all these parameters but you know this lecture the you know the topics that you, um, uh, you discussed regarding you know, in the motivating researchers that's the need of the hour so, like uh, showing them a roadmap, guiding them the roadmap and as you said like we are looking at nasa but why not isro there are opportunities of isro and isro is doing well so if we look at home and try to you know build some indigenous systems and of course you are there you know there's a guidance light so you know like we might benefit more and we can you know invite postdocs and Chinmoy and his team the iis team they are doing that it's a new institute so you know like isro can attract uh, you know students from all over the world and, and definitely would compete with nasa so that's what I'm hoping for, and I hope the students have been illuminated by this lecture. And it was great to hear to you, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, sir. So on this point, I would just like to highlight that we have a um, very strong uh, uh, relation with uh, JPL uh, and uh, Caltech. Also, we have our own uh, nano satellite program, and we have a scheme uh, through which some of our uh, toppers uh, go for higher education in Caltech uh, from uh, Department of Avionics, Department of Aerospace and Department of Art and Space Science. Every year the topper goes to uh, Caltech for MS and incidentally they are the uh, fast rankers in Caltech every year almost like and in general uh, in our uh, program uh, through that nano satellite program we take uh, students uh, who write to our group Dr. Priyodarshanam is there because Professor Siddhi mentioned this point. 
so there are some spectrum of opportunities here also and again going back to so yeah so actually i want to say, i mentioned one thing that chinchimo said uh, because he mentioned that the, the you know there all the comes first and all uh, you know i want to tell you all that that is not important uh, it, it did not come first to do well so you know uh, don't focus on those aspects because you know if you are studying well if you are understanding the basics well you will do well in your life so you know those are you know come first second all this third you know man made you know ranking system so that not always reflect who you are so do not get uh, you know disheartened if you are not the you know first boy or girl in your you know in your uh, uh, you know yeah, class. Yeah. so uh, not do not focus on that i am sorry to my just i want to say that no 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 thank you much i understand the point i mentioned is just to uh, you know give her an idea that it's not like that the students working in india or working in insti indian institute are, are not uh, the world class so they are definitely world class in fact our uh, dr chattopadhyay is the, is the example and he is the legend, legend as i we have already told so uh, going back to little bit of technical questions again so uh, related to this talk and as well as in general on the terahertz thing so there are a couple of queries from uh, someone vinoy ayar how is the on chip spectrometer sampling uh, the rf is it digitizing at the front end heterodyne or direct rf sampling so these are uh, connected questions yeah very good question i think i actually i, I saw the question from someone but i am not able to read all of them right so i think yeah. vinay yeah. ayar he is at evs student with bobby weichel uh hi vinay because bobby weichel was my ms uh, thesis advisor yes but we met at uh, we met at ims a few years ago i don't know if you remember hi hi, hi. So, uh, and then you know bobby weichel is the one who actually wrote a like, recommendation letter for me and suggested to for me to come to caltech so of course by bobby and i go back a long time uh, so very good question see we cannot sample at 500 gigahertz direct digital sampling at 500 gigahertz because you know that if you do an iquis sampling at 500 gigahertz you need to do uh, your sampling at you know 1 terahertz and we do not have digital chips that work at that frequency right so uh, what we do is we do heterodyning so our uh, from the that 500 gigahertz signal we bring it down to 3 to 6 gigahertz you know that you know that band so right now we are again to get a 3 gigahertz uh you know uh, if you are doing a 6 gigahertz bandwidth the uh, 3 gigahertz bandwidth you need to like uh, to sample at 6 uh you know 6 uh you know giga samples so we have developed the chip that can do 6 to 12 giga samples and so that's what our ir frequency is about 3 to 6 gigahertz so 3 gigahertz bandwidth and we uh, sample it at 6 giga samples or a little bit above so it is not direct we cannot do direct uh, digital sampling of our signal at 500 gigahertz right thank you very much there are a couple of queries from uh, uh, mr royan kormokar uh, i we know royan uh, pretty well because he works at scl semiconductor lab chandigarh which is under department of space uh, government of india so royan's queries are uh, regarding the of terahertz communication Uh, from the space perspective and the second question is the role of flexible electronics in future space program so so yeah these uh, these are very broad broad <laughs> questions <laughs> right i am you asking me to you know predict the future uh, uh, that generally we don't do uh, but anyway i'll give you my opinion uh, not really predicting it uh so in terms of the flexible electronics flexible electronics is very important because if you think about it not only space for anywhere else uh that is uh, you know flexible interconnect one of the thing is not only the electronics the interconnects part is very important because you are putting things together and then how do you connect them so if you have a flexible interconnect and then it is very useful for space application point of view also you have to think about how the properties change with uh, temperature and pressure and all these other environments that you have to be very careful about so yes if you can uh, develop flexible electronics it will be very very useful that is for sure and in terms of the terahertz communication yes for 
you know, terahertz communication is coming, whether you like it or not, the millimeter, high millimeter wave that you see. Uh, I am not saying that your next smartphone will be a terahertz smartphone. That is not going to happen anytime soon. There are a lot of challenges. However, you know, back end that, you know, the back hall of your you know, digital, uh, that network that you see, communication network is already moving to very high frequencies because the data rate that you need to handle is extremely high. And one of the way to go there is to use, uh, you know, these high frequencies to get the bandwidth that you need. So uh, it, it's already coming. And also in terms of point to point communication, Terra has already people have shown, you know, for Beijing Olympics, uh, Japan, uh, uh, telecommunication they did uh, from the the bird nest stadium to their uh, studio that was actually five kilometers away they did point-to-point -point communication at i think 240 gigahertz uh, range and right. very high uh, resolution videos and so you can do point you know terra has one problem is this line of sight as a result you'll have to think about slightly differently so massive mimo that you keep hearing so those are the uh, kind of techniques that you'll have to use if you are going to use terahertz communication. But again, it provides a lot of advantages in terms of bandwidth, but there is always cons because the uh, losses, atmospheric losses and others. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much once again, uh, Gautanda. As you said that there are challenges, but uh, there are uh, attempts also to mitigate those challenges. So one related question in the same areas uh, is I mean, I'll also chip in in this question after you address. Uh, can terahertz antenna be manufactured in India? A very good question. You should ask. Uh, you know, people who are in India, uh, so they will be able to tell. But my point on that is yes. I think if you, you know, you have to work with industry. You have to work with the capabilities. Is that you can you have to buy the machines that you need, um, and you have to buy you know that uh, you know a lot of uh, fabrication. Uh, you know facilities that with investment, a lot of places are investments are being made. One of the places, of course, in uh, Chinmoy's place, ISRO is doing it. Uh, IIT Delhi has measurement equipments as well as other, uh, you know, facilities. So that, and also IIT uh, Rurki, uh, they also have people are working in Terahut. So across India, there are a lot of people are working on Terahut. So you should try to actually form a terahertz group in India and interact with each other and see uh, what you can do. Uh, see, if we can do something, you can do. So there is nothing magic about any of this. So it is all about available funds and, uh, you know, and researchers, you'll have to push. As a researcher, you'll have to push, only then it will happen. Thank you very much, Thank Gautam. You. In fact, you have been one of the uh, one of our inspiration to start some activities. As, as I said, I want to chip in on this. In fact, we have uh, designed, fabricated, and successfully characterized some of the photoconductive antennas for terahertz application. So, as Gautam suggested, we need uh, different kind of facilities. So, we had a collaboration with SAC, and we did some measurement at Isar Trivandrum, you know, spectroscopy. Uh, instrument and we purchased some uh, silicon lens from Bato and with this we did some experiment. We are in the track. So definitely there are challenges, but it is possible to do some activities sitting in India also. So let me go to the next question. So this is a, again a uh, yeah, technical question from uh, Prokhar Gupta. Isn't it possible that the water from the asteroid or uh, material and art both come from some other source. If we can measure the ratios in the multiple asteroids, then maybe we can confirm. So it is related to the previous question. So, uh, uh, but let me make let me make a comment here that we find the asteroids actually do not have much water. So that is one of the things that we have found. So most of the water bearing, uh, carrying uh, are mostly comets because comets carry a huge amount of water. And as they go closer and closer to the sun, and that's when they start giving up their water, water and gases. So that's what happens. So again, uh, it's very valid question that we'll have to do multiple measurements. So one of the reason uh, I am developing that WhatsApp kind of, you know, CubeSat based uh, system is because we can make multiple keepsets and then they can get a ride with when when there is a main mission going somewhere and they can on the way they can actually throw out 
these CubeSats, very small uh, CubeSats, then they can go to a comet and do measurements. So we'll have to do multiple measurements uh, to um, you know, come to this conclusion. So as I said, we made only about 10 measurements so far. That is not enough. So for a statistically significant uh, you know, number, we need multiple measurements. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, very much, Gautam. We have a few more technical points, but uh, as I said, that some of those are connected and some of those are addressed from a different perspective. Even if you have uh, certain more queries, please feel free to write to us or you can uh, probably reach uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay directly. He, he will be very happy to address uh, your queries. But uh, now we want to have a little bit of more interaction because this is a real opportunity to uh, talk to the leaders and legends through this particular L4 platform. So to begin, uh, I request uh, Dr. Sarkar from IIC Bangalore to say something because he mentioned that he have some uh, specific queries to you. Dr. Sarkar. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I am audible. Uh, yes. Yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay, for the nice informative lecture. And uh, well, it is always a pleasure to hear from you. And I believe that I have heard uh, your number of <laughs> webinars in the last few months during this lockdown online. And uh, particularly in this uh, particular event, it was very inspiring to see some of the glimpses of your like journey uh, previously. I think that was not the part for many other webinars. So this particular one was inspiring for us. And I would like to thank uh, the L4 organizers for adding that bit. So well, question regarding the question, I have uh, mainly a uh, technical one. Actually, I was following your lecture. And uh, there were a number of points. Like one was regarding this uh, uh, CMOS-based synthesizer in the W band and the MEMS uh, in the terahertz. So, I was actually intrigued and because I'm just uh, starting my career, so the, I would like to seek some advice that if uh, I or someone else wants to work on those particular domain and try to develop them indigenously in India. So what could be the challenges and how should I approach that actual uh, problem or the uh, design and all this? Yeah. That's a very good, very good question, Devdeep, and good to see you. And congratulations for your new appointment at Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. Uh, yeah. You know, so uh, so Devdeep is very well recognized around the world. So all of you who are students, write to him, ask for a postdoc, uh, ask to become your stu his student. So you know, don't leave him alone. Just keep bombarding <laughs> him with requests. Uh, so that is one. And then, okay, to uh, answer the specific question, if yes, you uh, already have an IISC. I know someone, Gaurav Banerjee. He's a faculty. He is yeah. a great researcher, and he does work in uh, you know CMOS system. So work with him and you know in, you know first you know try to solve a specific problem. You know see what exactly you want to do. Say you know anything like let's say you want to build a radar at, at W band. Why not? Okay. You know yeah. make a yeah. you know make a big plan. You know I want to build a radar and then okay. try to you know break it down at you can do a single chip SOC based radar. You know most of the radar yeah. processing and everything can be done through a single SOC. So then work with Gaurav and then uh, come up with the design that you need to do and build a chip. Because the fabrication wise, in most of the time, there are other fabrication facilities. They you do not need to build. You know, CMOS fabrication costs, you know, billions and hundreds of billions mm -hmm. of dollars. So mm -hmm. that is not going to happen anytime soon. You can go to yeah. TTR, you know, uh, TSMC and yeah. get fabricated there. So only thing you have to do the design. So that you can do in collaboration with uh, you know other people like you have already uh, Vinay and others uh, so, sorry yeah. Google and Vinay and others at yeah. your institute so that is the way to approach this yeah okay 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 thanks a lot and just one more thing I would like to ask like this is not exactly related to this talk but a little bit technical like nowadays we hear a lot about this uh, quantum technologies and uh, thing. So are there any application or things that are going in the space research uh, with this quantum? Just a like, crazy question. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, answer is, the answer is yes. You know, quantum, if you look at quantum computation and quantum other technology, we use quantum technology already, not in quantum computation, uh, you know, start quantum limited, uh, you know, uh, uh, detectors we build. Quantum detected you know, in heterodyne the systems, quantum detected is H nu over K. That is your quantum noise flow, right? That is because comes from the back, back, uh, yeah, vacuum yeah. fluctuations. 
So mm-hmm. we actually build instruments which are almost, uh, you know, uh, quantum noise limited. So very close to, uh, you know, that uh, the best that you can build using uh, superconducting technology. And in terms of uh, your other quantum technologies, yes, there a lot of work is going on. Uh, and in the uh, when we talk about quantum, we mostly talk about quantum computation. That is because a big thing. Yes. But there are a lot of other quantum technology that is currently being used, being developed for space applications. So yes, answer is yes. This is very okay. important okay. area. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot once again for addressing the queries and for this beautiful uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks. Over thank to you, you Dr. Sir. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Dilip. So, uh, uh, one more query for the general audience, including myself. You talked about your early career trajectory, how you have uh, uh, started your uh, childhood and you have uh, reached to the pinnacle of success. Now, as far as the current uh, commitment of yours are concerned, like you are very much involved with your research, you are uh, involved with different administrative activities, you are in IEEE several boards, uh, MTTS and in general IEEE also. You are a distinguished lecturer, you are associate editors in uh, many journals, I know. So how do you manage your time to keep your uh, focus, research focus, technical focus, and leadership focus intact? And also, we know that you are very much involved with Indian uh, conferences. Also, you guide and mentor some of the activities. So this tip would be very, very useful for uh, you know mid-career people like me and other colleagues. Oh, that's a very good question. I don't know how to answer that question because, of course, you know, time management is one of the most important uh, aspect of everyone's career. Because how do you manage your time? Because most often, when you are busy you will realize that if 24 is not enough, 24 hours a day is not enough. But at the same time, I try to actually answer when people write to me, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, on WhatsApp or an email, I try to answer to all of you, uh, all of them. Sometimes if I'm a little bit delayed in answering, please bear with me uh, because not that I'm trying to ignore you, but you know, I, uh, there are other things to take care of. Yes, yeah, actually a very important question because it's not only the broader question as well, how do you, uh, you, know, b- you know, balance your uh, you know, personal family life as well as your research career, as well as your professional career. So you'll have to actually look into that aspect very carefully. Uh, do not ignore your family, do not ignore your personal life, you know, because professional life is important, but you know, personal life is more important. So that is one of the key. And thing is that we'll have to uh, have a team of people working around you uh, and dedicated people, and you'll have to trust them. You know, in the sense that uh, I never uh, micromanage anything. So whoever wants, and uh, whenever I am working in a group, I ne- I give so this give them the broad picture. This is where we want to go, and I do not go and ask them. You know, how much progress you have made? Where are you? Because uh, if you try to do that, then you lose control of everything because, you know, you do not really have time to do that. So you'll have to, you know, uh, trust people to make the you know uh, right decisions and then, you know, help them, of course, whichever way you can. And uh, this, uh, you know, uh, again, it, you know, do not focus on one aspect of it, you know, you know break it out in small, small uh, chunks and work on all those different areas at different times. But again, every individual manages their time in a different way. So as I mentioned at the beginning, my attention span is not very large. I lose focus very often. So actually I do something and then go something else. Maybe that's how I'm involved in so many different things and not doing a good job of all of them. So sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh, Once I think it's very nicely at. Your way of dealing with leadership really don't uh, micromanage and you be full freedom to the people you trust on, like myself and uh, Dr. Sarkar. We had some responsibilities in IMARC, and once you gave the responsibility, you fully believed on us, and we just executed finally uh, in the podium. Yeah, and yeah, thank you very much uh, again. So one more, uh, like a couple of more queries from my side before uh, some of my volunteers will have some queries to you. 
Like we are IEEE volunteers. Uh, we try to involve our students also in IEEE activities. So IEEE definitely being uh, technicalities in terms of certain uh, access of IEEE journals and all. But uh, that is very generic and most of the institutions nowadays have their institutional subscription for getting those access. So uh, at the very early career, what are the benefits that you uh, see, uh, rather foresee uh, for joining a young students at bachelor's or master's level at IEEE? So what are the benefits they can harvest in future? So uh, I always say uh, the most advantage at least from my perspective is the networking abilities because once you become a ITP volunteer ITP member it actually opens up your networking you actually are ex getting access to a lot of people who have uh, gone through you know uh, you know some experience and it, it, this that's very important today's days and age your networking ability your connection to people is very very important for your career uh, and so that is one of the things. Uh, and of course, you know, if you become a member, you're accessing to uh, this. When you go to an industry, you will find that suppose you are doing an undergraduate and then you just graduate, uh, finish your undergraduate and go to industry, your college might be having access to those journals, those magazines, but the industry, they don't. Then how do you, you know, keep, uh, you know, connected to this technology world? And if, if you are to make progress, let's say that you, after undergraduate, for some reason, you have to take up job and then, but you have in your mind, you want to come back and do your master's and PhD in future. And if you are not getting remain connected to this technology field, it will be very hard. So through that, that ITP membership actually provides you that connectivity, you know, during that time. And then you can, you can actually come back and join. So these are the two main uh, things. And also what ITP does is uh, the generous leaders, leaders. The, the, as you become a member and you know volunteer your time, you get to you know, interact with people and get trained in leadership. Because uh, in your career, at some point of time, you will be the leader. You will be leading an effort. You'll be leading people. So, how to become a good leader? Uh, that is very important. In you know, all of us, we we'll have to really learn well how to become a good leader. Uh, because that leadership. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, takes the institution or all the, your department, wherever you are working in the, whether it's going the right direction or not depends on your leadership. So these are the really lot of important areas that the a membership provides. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gautam. In fact, uh, if I remember correctly, many of my academic professional networking has happened through IEEE uh, platform. In fact, I came to know about Gautam and then uh, many more in different other conferences, the leaders and legends we brought in the last week. So all these happened through ITP networking. So I think the main point uh, for the student's perspective, as far as the you know harvesting or the reaping the benefits of joining ITP is the networking collaboration and also some of the opportunities that ITP provides to the students and the uh, different conferences, etc. So <coughs> with this. I sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, yes, sir, one minute. minute. Uh, yeah. IEEE chair, uh, Chennai is also here. Shanmuganandam. Uh, yeah, Dr. Samuganathan, good evening. You may ask your question, please. Good evening, sir. Uh, Shanmuganandam. Actually, I see how uh, to get the more funding to, uh, to do the more activities in the IEEE uh, APS, sir. How to get more funding? Because very less uh, funding only nowadays uh, they are allotting for the chapter that uh, societies. So how to get more funding? Yeah, yeah so it's a very good question. You know, there are many avenues of funding through IEEE. So one of the, as you said, the chapter funding is limited and fixed because if you are a, uh, you know, just a single chapter, chapter, then you get about $1,000 per year. And then if you are a joint chapter, then you get 500, 500 from, you know, each, each um, you know, societies. But there are other, you know, there is site, a site is that, you know, uh, that uh, uh, for humanitarian activity. So I took a lot of different programs. So through that, your chapter can actually ask for funding for those. 
like if you are organizing a workshop or a you know, conference at Kinmoy and others, they know, then you can actually ask for specific funding from, you know, all these multiple uh, different societies, they have uh, specific programs like education program they have, they have uh, for meetings and symposium programs. So you can actually approach the, those individuals, you know, the, Uh, so yes, look into look into that. I triply I have I'm seeing that I have some. To that and do not just depend on the fixed, uh, you know, chapter funding. You know, explore other uh, sources because I triply does have a lot of different programs. Right. I I just uh, want to take this opportunity to add on this like of both uh, dealing with uh, APS as well as NTTS society, as uh, Dr. Chattavadai suggested, there are many other revenues. So you have to conceive and you have to plan your uh, the activities and then you can uh, approach to the headquarters through proper channel. And uh, if your uh, plan is well, and if you really uh, aim for a good program for the benefits of students, then uh, there is uh, not much of problem in getting those sanctioned. In fact, uh, you know, I know from Gautamda that MTT Society has a lot of special initi initiatives. I believe APS also has those kind of things. For example, during last I mark and probably in each I mark, many students travel and their conference registration fee is completely taken care of by a micro theory and ethnic society. So I believe uh, Shamuga Nathan, uh, Dr. Over, you asked like APS might have similar kind of activities and events you have to just uh, so so you know, my my request to my request would be to make a joint chapter uh you know do mtt chapter as well not just ap in your uh, area so then okay. you'll have more opportunities for funding okay thank you thank you sir thank you yeah so uh i would request because some of our uh, office brs of mtt kerala uh, wanted to have some interactions with you so i would request only to Raise your point, please. Good evening, sir. Please, sir. Uh, I have one uh, technical question, actually. Like in, uh, please, uh, yeah. uh, like in space application, this uh, reliability and redundancy is very important. Like we, when it goes over to design, we have to eliminate single point of failure at such things. So now we have shown some CubeSat antenna, CubeSat, uh, where they're using some deployable antennas and other such components. In uh, terms of design, how we are uh, ensuring reliability, whether there is any uh, trade off between the reliability and performance that we have to take care of. So, if I, I, I repeat the question, your voice was breaking off. So, but what I understood, you are asking about in the reliability of you know, when you are having space mission, how do you actually make them reliable and what are that? And also, I saw, you know, briefly about someone was asking about reliability as well as performance. You know, how do you uh, actually compromise on, on those? It's a very good question. You know, of course, reliability has to be most important because, you know, in space, we say that failure is not an option. Because if you design something and you send stuff, you cannot go back and fix it. It, it doesn't work. So it has to be reliable. Uh, and to how do you do that? You actually through testing. You'll have to do a lot of, uh, you know, testing. And that's why whenever there's a space mission, people ask us, why it costs so much? It costs so much because you'll have to make it reliable. You'll have to actually look into all this. We call it accelerated life testing. So, okay, the space mission will have certain life. So it should not fail in that lifetime. Then how do you ensure, how do you know that your system is going to work for five years? Sometimes it takes seven years to go to the planet. And then you will start, it has its three years of lifetime then how we make sure that actually it works. So it's, we do accelerated life testing in the sense that we elevate the temperature. If you actually make a profile of how, what are the temperature ranges it will go through and what are the different environment it will go through. So we'll have to actually do those testing in those environment and make sure that nothing is failing. What is the probability of failing? What is the, what are the risks? How do you mitigate the risk? You know, redundancy is not always uh, possible. Of course, if you have a redundant system, then you are mitigating risk by having a redundant system. But redundant system means you need to have twice power, twice the you know uh, mass. So it's not always a prob uh, 
a possibility. So you'll have to think through all these, that how do you first assessing the risk, then mitigating the risk, and then coming up with the reliability uh, number that is, so this is how this reliable is. So that's what we'll have to think about. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have another second question. It's uh, slightly not technical. Uh, we already have heard of your phenomenal journey from this, uh, what I can call, from Hubli to this uh, NASA JPL. So now, in the course of this journey, uh, when and why you chose microwave? And what made uh, you to stick to it? Okay, that's a good question. You know, microwaves. So I when I was, uh, you know, when a lot of people who are doing undergraduate, you do not really know what you want to do. You know, I, I had, you know, during my undergraduate, I had a good teacher who was a microwave uh, engineer. So that, uh, you know, kindled some kind of interest. And then I went and joined TIFR. And there I was building a giant meter of radio telescope that is a microwave frequencies, of course. Uh, I started learning more and more and tried to find it fascinating. And that's why, but if, if even if I had not done microwave, it is okay. You won't have to do microwave. Whatever you do, you know, you, you have to have the passion for it. And, you know, I generated this passion, not necessarily that the day I was born, I wanted to do microwave. It is just that, you know, I uh, had a good teacher in college and then got this opportunity to work in microwave area that actually kindled my passion in that area. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Orijit. In fact, Orijit, uh, Anu Muhammad and some of our students, they are the uh, real pillar of this chapter behind these activities, the L4 and all the events that have happened. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity to keep this in order that they are uh, working uh, behind the curtain and the behind the scene. Uh, you know, the people who are making this chapter successful. Our AP chapter in 2018 got the best chapter award uh, under when I was chairman and Professor Anandan was the previous chair. So I believe our MTTS chapter is also quite vibrant and all credit to these youngsters and the volunteers. So before we are almost uh, two hours, so before uh, we conclude, I just want to have the last question to the speaker, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay. You have talked quite a few times that in your group, a lot of research happens over the coffee table. So you want to take your colleagues uh, and invite them for coffee. And then one more thing is, you know that, wow, omen of wisdom, then omen in microbes, omen in antennas. These are different kind of initiatives that IEEE also brings. So I remember in IMARC, you are very particular to have 50% members in some panel discussion and some other kind of stuff. So you always promote the uh, ladies and uh, you know women in different uh, platforms and technicalities as well. So can you please clap these two questions together and bring the perspective which motivate you uh, to have uh, to think that uh, research can happen over coffee table and we need really the uh, you know the women also in 50% uh, or close to in different uh, IEEE forums and podiums. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this up. Actually, it's a very important question. So, you know, in that respect, uh, I, I actually, there is a question from uh, Polumi Roy. She's actually a woman. So I saw that. So that I'll answer her question. That will also show that, you know, we really care about women. We want more women uh, to be in this area, in microbes and all aspects of life. So Polomi's question is that, you know, Enceladus, there could be possibility of life in Europa and Enceladus. And then how those are cold places, how can there be water, liquid water? The answer is that we are finding Enceladus as well as Europa, they have a metal like our art. So that is a source of energy. And that is actually keeping uh, this, you know, cold place, uh, the water in liquid form. And that's why we believe there's a possibility of life because there's a source of energy there. So that is uh, your question uh, and answering Polomi's question. So answer this, you know, let me first talk about the women, uh, you know, aspect. So if we look around, 50% of population is women. So it is very important that we have more women representation in our, you know, professional life as well. And it is not that there are not uh, qualified women available. It is not true that we have to find them. We have to make uh, you know, life more easier for them because there are a lot of hurdles. We put together, put hurdles on their path. So we'll have to go out of our way to make sure that they get this opportunity. 
they are qualified uh, they are studying you know science they are studying in you know science and engineering so why why shouldn't we you know have more women in all this that's why i always tell chinmoy and whenever you are having a panel make sure that we have women representation as well because you know when uh, this is my personal belief that when we have women in a uh, decision making process we make better decisions uh, that's because you know all of us are thinking in a different way so we should not leave out one section of our population who has so much to contribute so this is very very important for all of us who has who are in the position to make a change make a difference we should really think about that and make sure that we hire uh, more women qualified women and then they are they are available only thing we'll have to you know the women has you know a lot of you know and home home scenario they take care of family more so at, so in our workplace we'll have to make sure we make arrangements so that you know those aspects are, are you know looked into so it is very very important and it's onus is on us on men to make sure that we actually address this we cannot really tell you men, oh there is not enough women that is not an answer i am not ready to take that as an answer so it is on all of us to make sure that we support uh, all women colleagues and actually it's not that they're asking for a handout they are asking for a legitimate place on the table and that's what we should support and in terms of you know coffee table yes i, I keep saying teamwork and talk to people of different background talk to people with diverse background and go i go for coffee every day at uh, you know when uh, uh, there's no pandemic of course and then with, with my all the colleagues from all different fields they come we discuss a lot of things and that's where we actually talk sometimes talk about our problems we are facing and how we are trying to solve them so and you get different perspective you get in the different inputs and that's how uh, innovation happens at the beginning i said so it is very important go and talk to your friends go drink coffee tea whatever you would like to drink and you know meet people talk to them after the pandemic is over don't go out now and uh, so that's how you can make uh, innovative uh, ideas come to uh, reality thank you uh, again very much gautam that you have really addressed uh, both the aspects the research of a coffee table as well as the importance of, of the women representation in ieee and different panels uh, very nicely so before we uh, conclude formally uh, i would just request two of the student volunteers who watch tirelessly along with their academics for these uh, activities of uh, mtts kala chapter to turn on their camera akshat philip and sivada they work and support on various things the event flyers and this managing managing the webex uh, platform and etc akshat and sivada akshat sir yes sir yes sir much sir thanks It's a lot of of uh, all the audience and on behalf of MTTS Kerala chapter, I just wanted to you know special applauds and appreciation in presence of everyone. Thank you very much for your effort, uh, time, dedication, and the service to the MTTS Kerala chapter. So with this, we have come to the end of this particular program. Once again, thank you uh, very much, our speaker, beloved. Uh, I would say. a role model also because for everyone you need to have uh, someone whom you want to follow and you have to follow the footsteps dr chattopadhyay is one such person for me and i believe for many of you also uh, you know the way he has achieved uh, and he has not till reached the zenith of his career but still he is a legend in this particular field and he is a leader also so with this uh, we can uh, go ahead with the formal vote of thanks special thanks and appreciation on behalf of mtts kerala chapter to gautam chattopadhyay sir and everyone so dr anu mohammad uh, will be proposing the formal vote of thanks on behalf of mtts kerala chapter anu thank you sir in fact he is on behalf of PhD with professor radha yeah on behalf of mtts Sorry. kerala chapter APMTT chapters Indian Institute of Space Science Technology and GC Patan Hill we would like to thank Dr Gaudan Chattopadhyay for accepting our invitation and agreed to talk on sensors 
antennas and systems. Sar has covered all as aspects during his talk and interactive sessions on space exploration and various requirements associated with their missions, given practical insight, catering all segments like industrial and academic professionals and student community. I would like to thank all attendees, faculties from various universities across, across the globe, scientists or industrialists working with the various organizations across the universe. I am happy with the enthusiasm shown by the student community who attended the function and would suggest them to involve and join these kind of society chapters and get yourselves technically benefited. I'd also like to thank our college authorities for supporting the and always standing with our APMTT. I would also like to thank the office bearers of APMTT, especially Dr. Saha, Mr. Arjit Mitra for their extreme support to our college, especially to my undergraduate students by introducing this L4 webinar series, mentoring their projects, etc. Also for your generous support to GEC Bartonil, which is celebrating its 15 year of SB for formation. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of my students and their tireless commitments, uh, uh, the undergraduate students for our APMBT section. With this concluding, thank you and all to you, Saha, sir. Yeah, uh, so we have one more uh, dedicated is volunteer over here, uh, Ms. Gopika, who is uh, doing uh, very good research in Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. So I request Gopika to turn on your camera and say hi to uh, Dr. Chattavadai and conclude the session. Gopika? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for the nice yeah. 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 Uh, hope I am visible and audible. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the inspiring and informative talk. It's to hear you once again. And it was so, such a nice um, session that uh, we actually look forward and we start seeing uh, the dreams. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I want to thank. Uh, that for listening in, for tuning in, and I know you will be in India, you'll be hungry by now, it's almost 10 o'clock. So <laughs> please go and have your dinner. And again, uh, of course, we hopefully uh, we'll come out of the COVID on the other side and meet you in person someday. And uh, looking forward to that. And you know, keep up the good work. And again, when you go out, wear a mask, don't be in a good big gathering. <laughs> okay. So and thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Sir. Bye. Good. Goodbye, sir. Thank you very much, Gautam. And also, I remind all the participants about the fitness uh, tips uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay was having informally before the session started. He walks uh, 8 to 10 kilometers per day. So this is probably another uh, way to combat the COVID pandemic, to keep ourselves fit and agile as uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay. So with this, we conclude the session. Once again, uh, thanking the speaker, Dr. Chattopadhyay and also uh, for, for all the audience for their overwhelming response. So thank you very much. Uh, we close it formally. Uh, have a good day to Dr. Chavadhyay.